Now you are being shown you can escape. All that is needed is you look upon the problem as it is and not the way that you have set it up. So again, we're back to the problem is in the mind. And wrong mindedness is the problem. Right mindedness is the solution. <laughs> That's seeing the problem as it is, not the way that you have set it up, which would be seeing problems as specific and in the world, involving personhood in some way. How could there be another way to solve a problem that is very simple, but has been obscured by heavy clouds of complication, which were made to keep the problem unresolved? Without the clouds, the problem will emerge in all its primitive simplicity. The choice will not be difficult because the problem is absurd when clearly seen. No one has difficulty making up his mind to let a simple problem be resolved if it is seen as hurting him and also very easily removed. It's raising the darkness to the light. Bringing it into the light and exposing it is what results in the removal. Yes, an idea came through today when I was writing the mission statement. Was you know one idea was um, removing you know the messengers must um, see that they must look at the darkness and they must examine all beliefs and raise them to the light, which is a pretty common statement. We talk about raising beliefs to the light. It didn't stop there. It, the way the statement came out was they understand that to receive them requires they raise the darkened belief system ego in their minds to the light of truth. You know, it clumps it clumps the plural into a singular. Just getting back to there's one false belief. No matter how many forms it takes. That's another distinction when you go to seem to go to some of these places where people are getting into the deeper metaphysics. They laugh at the idea that there are beliefs that have to be raised to the light. Because that's an illusion too. <laughs> There's just one. It seems to take many, many different forms, but the whole clarity and the whole joy of enlightenment is in seeing that there aren't many. It's just one belief system, one really one belief that has to be seen where it is, which is in the mind. All the specific beliefs, even so far as you could talk about time and space, or we've read some of the other authors on the course talk about the two dimensions of reality and the temporal dimension spatial. and the spatial dimension. You know, even if you took it to time and space, Again, those are, just forms. those are two forms of the same error. And the key is seeing the error, raising the, the error to the light. And then all of the specific forms, time, space, bodies. We've talked about it in the metaphor of the uh, overhead projector, all the overlays. You could just look at the stack of overlays. <laughs> You know, it has to be kind of raised up. It seems, it's a very helpful metaphor for, for those that seem to be just coming into this to talk about in terms of concepts, because that's the way, the, that's what it seems to be a process of, of pulling those out and looking at that. And the deceived mind can relate to that. That's why we have stages of the development of trust. That's why we have a workbook with 365 lessons. 
And that's why Jesus uses the term process at times. Because that's what the deceived mind can relate to. It's the only thing it can relate to because it believes in incremental, sequential time. And, th and that's what else is a process, but sequential time. The, quote, reasoning by which the world is made, on which it rests, by which it is maintained, is simply this. You are the cause of what I do. Your presence justifies my wrath, and you exist and think apart from me. While you attack, I must be innocent, and what I suffer from is your attack. So there's the, the key line in there could be, while you attack, I must be innocent. You see the subject-object split, and you also see that the deceived mind believes that attack and innocence can coexist. You see how the, underneath that statement, while you attack, I must be innocent, is the belief that attack and innocence can coexist. And the teachings of the Course is, there's no way. If attack is real, innocence is not. And the corollary could be, since attack is unreal, then innocence is real. But they don't coexist. Another version of it would be, you know, in the workbook where Jesus says, you still believe you have to forgive the truth. Well, the mind that believes that the attack is real sees that as true. And so, it's, it also, being deceived, believes that it has to somehow forgive attack. This was a distinction that came up early on in the first visit to God's country place where one of the enlightened awake teachers was teaching that attack is real, but you have to it. overlook it. You have to be loving in the face of attack. And what we're seeing clearly stated here and in many other places is that, that if attack is real, then there is no innocence. There is no guiltlessness, sinlessness. No one who looks upon this, quote, reasoning exactly as it is could fail to see it does not follow and it makes no sense. Yet it seems sensible because it looks as if the world were hurting you. And so it seems as if there is no need to go beyond the obvious in terms of cause. If you had to invent a motion picture, or if you had to invent a backdrop or a screen that would be convincing that the world is hurting you, this would be your drama. <laughs> As it seems, whether you're watching the news, reading the newspapers, looking here, looking there, right in your own household, anywhere around, it just seems like that is teaching, that's what the world is teaching. That the cause of, of all hurt and suffering seems to be in the world. Not enough food, not enough clean air to breathe, pesticides and diseases and burglars and wars and all the different things that have seemed to be perceived in the world are seem to be the causes of all the misery and upset and none of those are the cause. So I'll reiterate, go over that last sentence again of the paragraph. And so it seems as if there is no need to go beyond the obvious in terms of cause. You have 
that's a, a major idea. That's why, you know, in so many discussions and conversations that it just seems to be at the surface, or even when you come together and you talk about, like you've been saying, we need to go much deeper on this communication idea. If, if I believe that, well, I've got this world pretty well figured out and I pretty much know the causes of, of lack of communication, that there are worldly inhibitors of communication. All we have to do is change those worldly inhibitors and we'll have better communication. Then why would I want to go, why would I want to spend time in sessions going so deeply in all those things? You know, that's the key. We're on page 540, first edition. Dreamer of the dream. There is indeed a need. This is where all. This is why we look so carefully at every single belief and everything in the mind, because there is a need to look. For, for cause within the mind and, and not to keep relying on belief that there's the cause of my misery, the cause of my upset is in the world. The world's escape from condemnation is a need which those within the world are joined in sharing. Yet they do not recognize their common need for each one thinks that if he does his part the condemnation of the world will rest on, on him. And it is this that he perceives to be his part in his deliverance. I remember early on when I was working with the Course, I mean, I would have the thoughts come to mind of, of a flash here and there of martyrdom, kind of like this is so radical, this is so different <laughs> from the world that I would just have the thought, I just would have a flash of myself of like being a martyr. I mean, that's the, the typical um, uh, or the often a cr uh, interpretation of Christianity has been, you know, anyone who would completely follow Christ must in some way be ready to bear the cross of Christ as he did. You know, one fellow who was writing about Christianity says, um, it has been tried and found to be too difficult. <laughs> you really start to go into the Gospels and, you know, take no thought for what you wear, for what you eat, and, you know, it's like, oh, um, you know, when you really start to look at the teachings and you really follow them in, it seems to be too difficult or impractical. And in one sense, that's where it's what we're reading about in this paragraph can come in. You know, it can seem to be that there, the condemnation of the world will rest on him. And it is this that he perceives to be his part in this deliverance. Like somewhere along the line, I'm going to have to pay a price for following this course. It's not going to be pleasant. Like it's somehow like it's going to be a bitter pill. But that's part of of atonement or salvation is to swap, swallow the pill, no matter how big it is, boom, get, a, get that big glass of water to wash it down and and just to do it. And it's that it can't be so. It can't be that there's a price to pay for what you are. I remember when I was at God's Country Place also there, there was discussion of this enlightened being of, of his moment of awakening from the dream was described as excruciating, excruciatingly painful. And I remember hearing that and in the discussion with some students and saying, well, that's certainly not my experience <laughs> of it. And I was told, you don't have any experience. Oh, you can't go, you can't go much farther with the conversation.